Well, our first practical project, number one, is about just a very simple programming of the method of moments to solve the simplest possible problem. The simplest possible problem is the electrostatics case because it is a scalar problem and it allows us to address the 3D case in with, without the complications of the electrodynamics formulation. In fact, you will see in practical project 2 that in two dimensions you can solve the electrodynamics case also using scalar equations for different polarizations TE or TM polarizations but not for the 3D case. The 3D case needs, uh, for the, electro for the ele electrodynamic case, needs a full vector formulation that makes the formulation uh, uh, and programming more complicated. So, if we, if we want to solve something in 3D with the simplest possible programming, it has to be the electrostatics case. Our unknown will be the electrostatic potential, which is a scalar quantity, and so we will be able to solve the three-dimensional case and concentrate in the meshing of the surfaces using a triangle mesh. So we will learn how to handle the triangular mesh of a surface without being involved in the complications of the vector formulation. The, let's first Let's see the integral equations to solve in 3D and then we will uh, go to the 2D case. In 3D, we will solve the Poisson equation for the potential. I told you that the unknown is the potential. And we know that the Laplacian of the potential is equal to minus the volume charge density over the dielectric constant, the dielectric permittivity epsilon. And in order to solve the problem, we need a boundary condition. The boundary condition will be the potential at, the, at a perfectly conducting surface. This is uh, PEC, this is perfectly conducting. Okay. In a perfectly conducting surface, the potential is constant. So we will set a potential in this surface and then solve the, the problem for the potential everywhere and the induced charge at the boundary of the of the object. In fact, although here in the Poisson equation, in theory, the induced charge can be everywhere, the sources of the charge can be everywhere, in practice with a perfectly conducting object surrounded by vacuum or by air, the only place where we can have uh, where we can have charges in statics is the boundary, the surface of the perfectly conducting object. It's the only place where we can have charges. So we will we'll make our formulation for surface charges that are in fact induced charges that appear automatically when we set the potential. You know what, what happens when we set the surface to a certain potential, then uh, uh, a charge distribution appears that produces a field that is consistent with that potential so that if E is the, is the field so that the potential uh, can be is equal to minus the integral of the field in line integral okay the potential difference between two points okay or from infinity to a given point is equal to the integral of of the electric field the line integral of the electric field from the infi from infinite to the point where we where we evaluate the potential, okay. So automatically, when we set the surface to a potential, automatically a charge distribution appears. This charge this charge distribution comes from a redistribution of the electron of the electrons and the atoms of the of the of the conductor. You know that there is a, a, a electron cloud that and they can distribute. Uh, they can be distributed. So the, there is a charge distribution that, of course, that there is a, a, a charge distribution that will produce that field that will be consistent to the potential so that the integral of the pot from infinity to 
any point will be the potential at that point or from infinity to the surface will be B0, the potential, uh, the surface potential, okay? So, to solve the problem we need a Green's function, so the Green's function we know that in statics is, is the potential due to a point charge and it is 1 over 4 pi epsilon and then the distance from the source to the point R where we evaluate the potential, the source is assumed to be at the origin. So we make, we com know that the, uh, the solution for a given charge density is equal to the convolution of that charge density with the uh, green function or impulse response. And we can write this convolution integral like this. Then we set the boundary condition, the potential at the surface S is equal to V0 and setting at the independent term the known potential at the surface, the boundary condition, we get an integral equation where everything is known, B0 is known, Epsilon is known, except the charge. The charge is the unknown of our integral equation. In 2D, we have an object, the perfectly conducting object has uh, axial symmetry, that is the object is in this case, for example, this is just an example, is a circular cylinder that it has constant, uh, the surface is constant along set coordinates. So this goes to infinity, this is infinite, okay, infinite at the top and infinite at the bottom, it's an infinite uh, circular uh, cylinder not necessarily circular, it, uh, circular it, it can be any shape, but it has, it must have this translation symmetry along uh, set direction. That is, the boundary condition must be independent, or, or, or independent on the set direction. If this, is, if this is the case, of course, the potential is constant in the surface, so the potential and the boundary condition is uh, con the boundary condition is constant along set direction because in any perfect conductor the, at the surface of the, of the perfect conductor the, the potential is constant and therefore the potential everywhere on the field which is the gradient of the potential uh, is constant in set direction. Everything is constant in set direction. everything, all the, all the variables, okay? Everything is constant in set direction. So we don't need to solve the problem in set direction. We only have two variables x and y where uh, two dimensions x and y where the, the all the magnitudes, electric field, potential, charge, etc. can vary. The, the charge of course also depends on x and y but not on set uh, coordinate, okay? So, in order to solve this, we set a, a Green's function that is the, the potential due to a point charge in XY. But what is a point charge in XY? Point charge in XY, let's use another color. A point charge in XY is a point in xy plane, for example, at the origin, but it must be constant along set direction because everything is constant along set direction. So it becomes a line of charge. Okay? A line of charge, uh, imagine, for example, that it is just one coulomb per meter, of course, you have to specify the charge per unit length because the total charge for the infinite line will be infinite. So you have to char specify the charge per unit length and, ex uh, and it can be, for example, one coulomb per meter. And the potential produced by this line of charge will be the Green's function for the two-dimensional problem because the near, now the point source is a point in XY plane, but it must have a symmetry, it must be constant along set direction. Okay, 
So uh, we have to compute the potential to compute the Green's function. You must compute the potential due to a line of charge. We set uh, this line of charge at the origin, one coulomb per per meter. Okay, and uh, of course the electric field must uh, have this symmetry. The electric field can only be radial, radial field like here, like in this arrow. It must be radial, it cannot have set component or phi component due to the symmetry, and it will depend only on rho coordinate. You know rho coordinate is the distance to a set axis. Depend only on rho coordinate because due to the symmetry, it cannot depend on, on set coordinate, nothing depends on set coordinate, and it also cannot depend on phi uh, coordinate because we have a symmetry, everything is is constant on on phi also. This for the uh, point uh, source that is the line of charge. Of course, once we have our uh, actual cylinder that if it is not circular, there will be a dependence in phi in general, but not for our case here we are computing the Green's function. The Green's function is due to a line of charge. The line of charge has symmetry about a uh, phi uh, coordinate and then there will be no dependence on, on phi. And now that we know uh, what is the symmetry of the electric field must be like that, we can uh, uh, apply uh, Gauss law to compute the field. This procedure is a stand standard. We know that the flux of the electric field across a closed surface will be equal to the to the enclosed charge. So per unit length we have to integrate the electric field around a circular cylinder and the integral is 2 pi rho which is the radius of, of that uh, cylindrical surface times the value of the electric field normal to that surface is the rho component of the electric field and this is equal to the charge enclosed per unit length over epsilon and we isolate here the electric field rho component and get that result for the electric field. This is a standard, you already did this in your electromagnetics, uh, electromagnetism courses and, and your bachelor studies, so you all of you know about that. On, and then we know the potential and we can compute uh, the, uh, the, sorry, we know the electric field and we can compute the potential because we know that the electric field is minus the gradient of the potential in cylindrical coordinates the, the, for a potential that depends only on rho coordinate the potential has the same symmetry as the electric field it cannot depend on set coordinate nor on phi coordinate it depends only on rho so the, in, in the gradient in cylindrical coordinates for a potential that depends only on rho is the derivative along rho coordinate of the potential and, it, and this is equal to the electric field so here we isolate the potential just integrating the right hand side term the integral of 1 over rho is the logarithm of rho so we get uh, this for the potential it is interesting to know that the potential is the logarithm of rho this is this potential is the potential due to a line uh, charge which is, which is the two-dimensional point source and this will be our Green's function in two dimensions so our Green's function will be the logarithm of, of the radial distance rho times some constant that include the, the permittivity of the medium epsilon okay this is our Green's function now we know that the potential at some point is equal to the Green's function convoluted with the charge, so we compute this convolution integral here, this is the charge, and we set the boundary condition, we uh, sample the potential at a coordinate rho belonging to the boundary of the cylinder, set the boundary condition, we know that the potential there must be equal to V0. And again, we have an integral equation in which we know everything. We know the potential V0, 
because we set a battery to, to fit that, that uh, surface with some potential. We know the epsilon of the medium and the only unknown here is the charge. So the charge will be the unknown of our integral equation in 2D. Now we have the integral equation in 3D here, integral equation in 3D and integral equation in 2D. The differences are that the Green's function, the two-dimensional or three-dimensional Green's functions are different, but also in 3D you have a surface integral and you ha will have to model your surface with a triangle mesh, while in 2D we have a, a contour integral, a line integral around the, the, around the boundary of the cylinder, and here our surface will be a line. Our, in fact, it is the intersection of the actual three-dimensional surface, which is cylindrical, with the xy plane, and this line will become our our boundary. So it will be a line boundary, and it will be much easier to discretize because a line boundary can be discretized very easily using uh, line uh, some uh, <coughs> line segments, and these line segments. In, in this line segment, we will define pulse. Uh, we will define pulse, uh, rectangular pulse, basis functions to mod to to approximate the current within the segments. Okay, so the geometry is a line and will be approximated with strike segments, and within that strike segments, the current not the current is the current it's the charge. The charge will be approximated using rectangular pulses. Okay. Well, now I have some slides uh, with the method of moments procedure, but you already know that because we dedicate some time in the in the theory class and also you already did an assignment uh, about method of moments to, to solve an integral equation with method of moments. So I will be very, very uh, fast here just to remind you that you, we approximate our unknown with a linear combination of basis functions. The linear combination coefficients q, n will be the uh, elements of the unknown vector, okay, in our uh, in our linear system. Okay, now we substitute the the approximation to the unknown in our equation, our linear operator in this case is the Laplacian, and um, no, sorry, not, not our linear operator here is the convolution with the Green's function. Sorry, so we will substitute uh, this, and we get uh, this here. You know that you already know that, and this is an equation in which the unknown there is only one unknown that are the coefficients, but this is. It, it, it is a still a question with functions because here xn are the basis functions and the operator which that is the convolution with the green function applied to the basis functions are still functions so we have to discretize this into numbers and we will what we will do is to uh, compute the residual that is the error with the boundary condition and then uh, multiply with some weighting functions etc but here our weighting functions will be uh, uh, point matching we will do some point matching okay you know that so what we will get essentially is a sample of the potential at some point at some set of points Rm will be equal to this, okay? And here uh, it's the operator applied to the basis function n but sampled at x at r at the sampling point Rm, okay? And this will be our equation. So here, the, we get uh, from this equation we get the linear system. In this case, as I told you before, uh, we will be doing point matching. So this will be as simple as the linear operator uh, 
acting on the basis function and sampling the result at point Rm, okay? And here it will be V0 at Rm, as I told you before, okay? So this clearly, this equation clearly is that linear system with these uh, elements, okay? Now the basis function, the basis function will be rectangular, rectangular pulses so we will compute the convolution of the rectangular pulses of uh, here the basis functions are rectangular pulses the linear operators the convolution with the Green's function so we have to compute the convolution of the rectangular pulses xn with the Green's function okay and this is an integral that we can compute easily in fact if the position of the rectangular poles here and the evaluation point here, this is the center of the rectangular poles is Rn, the size of the rectangular poles is Hn, so this is the basis function, the rectangular poles here, okay, and the point where we evaluate the field is this, is the distance between the rectangular poles and the point where we, where we evaluate the potential is far enough, in fact if it is larger than the size larger enough than the size of the rectangular poles then we can approximate this uh, logarithm as, as constant in the integration domain and so the only thing that we get is the integral of our rectangular poles of amplitude 1 which is equal to the, this the integral is equal to the width of the rectangular pulse which is hn each rectangular pulse can have different uh, size so or different length so in fact this is equal to hn and then we have the potential that we have taken out of the integral okay and then we do some point matching and remember that in point matching we set the evaluation point at row uh, m for a set of points for a set of points okay and then we directly get in this way the elements of the linear system matrix and the elements of the independent vector i have been very 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 fast because I repeat, uh, we, I explain, I, I, sorry, I, I uh, explain all this in detail in the theory class and also you have done an assignment with, with this, okay? So we have this, but there is a problem. Here I said this is valid when the evaluation point, that is the evaluation point uh, rho m, is far away rho m is far away from the position of the basis function the position of the rectangular pulse rho n so that means that the distance between them must be large compared to the size of the of the basis function that is as i plot you as i said before for example this is the basis function the size of the basis function this is the evaluation the evaluation point, okay, and this is the distance from the center of the basis function, rho n, which is the distance from one to the other, okay? Well, uh, how much large must this be? Okay, in fact, if uh, in practice it is not bad if they are not the same basis function. So that is, if it is rho n, I can set rho m even, of course it will work very well if we are evaluating at a testing function that is, at a testing point that is very far away from the basis function. This is the basis function here. This is the basis function, okay? I can, maybe I can draw the basis function in blue color. So this is the basis function, okay, in blue color. So for the testing points that are far away in the, uh, from the basis function, it's okay. But even 
from the testing point that is at the center of the testing or basis function neighbor to the actual basis function, it is not bad. We can, it's not extremely accurate, but it's not bad and we can do it. We can do it. The only problem is that we cannot do this if we evaluate the field at a point inside inside the basis function in particular and the center of the basis function because then we will have rho m equal to rho n and this will be zero this will become zero and the logarithm of zero is infinite so or minus infinite doesn't matter so we cannot apply this to compute the diagonal terms if the row index m is equal to the column index n we have to do the source integral analytically we cannot do this one point approximation that works very well for testing points that are far away from the basis function is not bad if the uh, testing points are close to the basis functions even if they are at the neighbor basis function but doesn't work if the evaluation point is at the middle of the basis function. So in this case, we will do the, co the integral analytically. So the convolution of the uh, basis function with the Green's function, this is the Green's function, evaluated, this is evaluated at row M, okay? This convolution must be integrated uh, analytically. In this case, it is very simple because if we have a rectangular pulse, its amplitude is equal to 1. So the only thing is to integrate the logarithm in a domain, in a, in a domain that is equal to the, <coughs> to the width of the, to the domain of the basis function. And if it is centered at the origin for simplicity, it goes from minus the width to, to minus, from minus h to h, which where h is the width or length of the basis function and this integral can be computed analytically here you have the procedure to compute the integral and this is the result so this is the formula for the elements and the diagonal of the of the, the matrix so now you have a formula for all the elements for the elements that are outside the diagonal you have this and for elements that are in the diagonal, you have this. Now you have a formula for all the elements. So, what uh, do you have uh, to do? First, you have to discretize the geometry. I told you to discretize, for example, the geometry like this, using a strike uh, segments, okay? like this, okay? So, the segments will be defined by two parameters. The position are, well, rho, because we are, I say rho because we are in two dimensions. The position rho, this is x and this is y. The position rho n of the center of the segment, or here, for example, another rho n, the position at the center of the basis function and also and the other parameter will be the width of the basis function hn so we have two parameters one vector parameter that are the two coordinates of the center of the basis function x and y coordinates of the center and another parameter which is a scalar parameter and it's the length hn of the of the basis function and here I suggest you that to operate with that using MATLAB in order to operate easily with vectors you define a vector in the xy plane a vector rho in the xy plane that has a component x and a component y okay that you just define a complex number with real part equal to x an imaginary part equal to y so in the complex plane 
our complex number r will be equivalent to the vector row of x of, of uh, x component equal to the real part of r and y component equal to the imaginary part of r. And this is very useful because now you can make some operations, not all the operations, but you can make some of them. For example, you can subtract uh, vectors, just uh, subtracting the two complex numbers. You can compute the modulus of a vector, that is the distance between uh, row 1 and row 2, as the absolute value of that complex number, that is the difference between the two complex numbers. You can multiply, for example, imagine that you have to multiply uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon times your, your vector, okay? Um, to say an example, then you just use the, your complex number. If the complex number is r, you multiply uh, your complex number by that scalar constant. It's the same as multiplying the two components of your vector with a scalar com constant, okay? So you can do some of the vector, for example, you cannot do a cross product like that, okay? You cannot do everything, but you can do most of the useful vector operations using complex numbers. And it's very useful because, because now your code, your program will become simpler and smaller and easier to check for bugs and it will be more difficult to, uh, to make uh, mistakes, okay? It will be much better. So, in order to discretize the boundary, you have to write a function that for a given boundary, for example, a circular cylinder or a machine a circular cylinder can be a possible boundary, a rectangle, uh, a plate, uh, just a planar plate that becomes in two dimensions, a planar plate in two dimensions becomes a striped line, a striped segment. You, given an, an object, you can write a function that returns a vector with the center points of the basis and another vector with the length. That is, you write you, uh, a function, for example, uh, in MATLAB, <coughs> you write a function that returns the position of the... a vector containing the position of all the basis, the centers of all the basis functions and, the, and, a, and a vector, a second return parameter, that is, or second return argument, that is the width h of all the basis functions. And this will be, for example, uh, uh, my object, uh, can be a, a function called my object or whatever you want, okay? And here you can pass uh, some parameters, for example, if the object is a circular cylinder, you can give as argument the radius of the circular cylinder, okay? And then your function, computes the position of the center of all the basis functions and the width of all the basis functions and return these two uh, variables as a return arguments, okay? Now you have done your uh, object uh, boundary discretization. Once you have your, or your uh, object boundary discretization, then you uh, set uh, the linear system uh, and solve and solve it uh, for the charge, for the charge Qn. Qn will be the charge at any of the basis functions. Remember that in method of moments, here, in method of moments, we have uh, basis functions that are pulses, rectangular pulses of amplitude equal to one. So the, ch the coefficient that multiplies the basis functions, and the coefficient that multiplies the basis functions that becomes the unknown on the linear system, this coefficient is also the charge at its basis functions. So you know that uh, the solution is the charge at the basis function. And once you have the charge, you can plot, you can compute, for example, and um, plot, you can compute the potential everywhere. You can compute the potential uh, at all points x, y in a space. And to do this, you need uh, first to uh, do a space uh, sampling. If this is space, you must do a space sampling. So you must compute the position of samples in a space here. Well, this is very bad. I will do a better drawing. So 
So, sorry. We'll do a better way. Uh, we can compute, we can mesh our space and compute the position of some points to evaluate the field. These are just points where we evaluate the field and the potential. Okay? These are points in, in the XY space where we will compute the field and the potential. To do this, first uh, we uh, compute uh, two vectors of x and y coordinate using a lean space function call and we get uh, here uh, the x position of, of our samples and the y position of our samples in these two vectors x and y and then we use the mesh grid function to obtain the uh, some uh, matrices containing the x coordinates and y coordinates of all the points in the mesh. This is very is useful. I assume that you already know the mesh grid function from your previous courses. Those who have studied uh, telecom engineering at our school know to already know how to do this, and I hope that the others uh, can do this easily. And if not, you can just uh, check. The, document, the MATLAB documentation for the mesh grid uh, uh, function and do some and play uh, some examples with it. Okay, and once we have the vector xx containing the posi the x coordinate of all the points in our rectangular mesh, and the yy vector containing the y coordinate of all the points, we can compute another matrix. That is a com that contains complex numbers having the x coordinate and the y coordinate of all the points as real and imaginary part of these complex numbers, and this will become very convenient because then we can compute, for example, r that is the distance from the basis function to the evaluation point for all the points in the grid just easily using a, a subtraction of two complex matrices and taking the absolute value, and and then we can compute the potential at these points by adding the contribution of all the basis functions. Here you have, we have to look over all the basis functions to compute the contribution of each one of them. So we start assuming that the potential is zero everywhere, and then we add to this potential to zero we add the contribution of the first basis function, then the contribution of the second, then we add the contribution of the third, etc. So we loop over basis functions. This n is the basis function index, okay? You see, this n is the basis function index. So we loop for all the basis functions. First iteration is basis function one, second iteration basis function two, third iteration basis function three, and then we compute the distance from that basis function n to all the to all the other evaluation points and this distance here in our integral equation here this is the r distance that allows us to compute uh, the values of the green function for all the evaluation points multiplied by the charge and then sum everything which is the uh, the contribution of that adding to add the contribution of that uh, basis function here and then we sum this contribution of that basis function to the previous um, potential due to the previous contributions of earlier uh, of the other basis functions, the basis functions that are already calculated. Okay, so I repeat, we set initially the potential to zero because at the beginning we have not computed uh, any basis function yet, and then we uh, start with to loop for the basis functions, adding the contribution of basis function one, two, three, etc. For to do this, we first compute the distance r from that basis function n which and the position of that basis function n is r r of n and then uh, this is the the distance mm, uh, and then we sh the position of that uh, basis function we subtract the position of the evaluation points and what we get 
is the distance from that basis function to all the evaluation points. We substitute that, that r in the Green's function, multiply by the charge, and get the contribution of that basis function to the potential at all the evaluation points. And we add this to the uh, matrix of potential, I say matrix, because this matrix contains the potential at all the uh, evaluation points. This is B, is here, B is a matrix containing the potential at all the evaluation points, okay? And once we get, and once we have got the potential at all, at all the evaluation points, we can uh, plot uh, using it in nice pictures. I will tell about these functions in the in the next slide, in the next slide, yes. But we have to check uh, how good is this. We have to check the error that we have in order to know that uh, the programming, the formulation is okay, the programming is right, there is no mistake. And to do this, we need uh, to compare our results to some known reference. What can we do? We can compute the capacitance of a capacitor for which we can exactly and analytically compute that capacitance. And the easiest case is the, a capacitor consisting on two parallel infinite cylinders. The cylinders are circular cylinders. So in fact, it is like, imagine that it is like the bifilar transmission line, okay? But it can be easily, you can uh, just make a capacitor by these two uh, circular infinite cylinders in 3D. It looks like that in 3D, okay? This is a set axis and everything is constant in set axis. So in there are in 3D, there are two infinite uh, parallel uh, circular cylinders, but in 2D, in the xy plane, in 2D xy plane, they, these cylinders become two circles, two circles of radius r, r is the radius, okay, r is the radius, of radius r center at a distance d uh, from the origin, okay, center at a distance d from the origin. That is, you can set them in the x-axis, one of them at position d, the other at position minus d, the radius is r, the voltage difference between them is v, so you can set the voltage of to b over 2 plus uh, b over 2 uh, for one of them and minus b over 2 for the other. The potential difference will be b. Then you can compute the capacitance and compare with the exact formula. The exact formula is pi epsilon over the r the arc hyperbolic cosinus of d over r. D is the position of the circular cylinder and R the radius, okay? And then, how can we compute numerically the capacitance? Well, the capacitance is the charge over V. V is known because V is one of the parameters of the problem. We often set V equal to 1 from the beginning, okay? This is the V that you have used when you set the linear system in the, at the independent term an independent term of the linear system, you have to set a value of b, and this b is b0, okay? So here I can, I said b, but it can be b, it is b0, but it's in b in our computer, well, it's b0, okay, I can set b0 everywhere. And we know b0, how can we compute uh, q? q is the total charge of the cap of one, in one of the conductors of the capacitor. The total charge is the sum of the charges at all the individual basis functions. So we have to sum for n, n are the basis functions, the charge of the basis function times the time, sorry, times the, the length of the basis function. Why? Because uh, Q is in fact a charge density. Remember that this Q comes from, this Q comes from the charge density here. Q is the charge density, this Q is the charge density of our integral equ equation. So in the integral equation, our Q is always the charge density. So the total charge in one basis function is the 
charge density q times the length of that basis function. So this is the charge in basis function uh, n, okay? And we can easily compute this sum just computing the dot product of vector h that contains the length of all the uh, basis functions times the vector q that contains the charge of all the basis functions. So you ha we have to multiply hn times qn for all the basis functions and then sum and we can do this easily with a MATLAB operation like that which is in fact a dot product, okay? And of course we have to divide by b in order to, to compute the capacitance. So, regarding the plots, I told you in the earlier, in the previous slide, I told you to use these functions to, I will highlight them in black color, I told you to use this basis, not, sorry, this basis, I told you to use these functions to plot nice pictures of the potential, and I can show you here some examples. The surf function, surf stands for surface, it draws a very nice uh, surface plot. That means that in vertical coordinate, we have your, you have your variable that is the potential, and in the horizontal coordinates, you have the uh, um, x, y, and y variables. So you can plot a surface of the values of the matrix, the potential matrix. Remember that V contains, V con is a matrix that contains the potential at all the field or potential evaluation points. So it contains the potential at a grid of points like this, okay? This is the contents of the V matrix. So you pass V matrix as an argument to solve function. You can pass also the X and Y uh, vectors to produce uh, a correct scaling of the x and y axis here, and it will draw a very nice plot. Similarly, you can use the p color uh, function. p color produces this color uh, plot. Is p color stands for pseudo color. This pseudo color plot that in that for x, let's for example, this will be nice. That for x, not maybe in black color. For x and y, it plots a, a color. It makes a color plot, and you can uh, see the, the quantities associated to the color with this color bar function. You, the color bar function adds a color bar here that indicates the values of the potential corresponding to each color. You can also use this uh, color map. Yet, this color map function changes the color map and in fact the jet color map is the in my opinion is the nicest to see the values of a variable like that this is a color map that it's like a light spectrum it ranges from from blue which is the the one extreme of the spectrum to red which is the other extreme of the spectrum and it's nice because uh, blue stands is that is the colder uh, color is the represents the lower values of the function so here you have the lower values in blue color then you start increasing the values and get a cyan color here you get green color then you get yellow color orange color etc and you end up with dark red color which is the hottest uh, color here <coughs> okay so you will get a very nice uh, color plot. But you can enhance your color plot uh, with uh, arrows representing the flow of the electric uh, field. In fact, you can compute the electric field knowing the potential matrix as the gradient of minus the potential. Here B is the potential matrix containing the potential at all the field evaluation points or potential evaluation points. So gradient which gives you two, will give you two arguments. EX will be a matrix containing the X component of the field at all the evaluation points. And EY will be a matrix containing the Y component of the electric field at all the field evaluation points. And you can pass these two 
variables i, x and i, y to the quiver function. Quiver function will draw the arrows corresponding to that uh, electric field. You can also uh, pass the coordinates as arguments the coordinates of the sampling points to get a correct scaling of the x and y axis. Okay? And additionally, you can draw lines of constant potential, that is contour lines. These lines are lines of, of constant potential that are perpendicular to the arrows representing the electric field because the electric field is the gradient of the potential. And it's very nice. And you can do this with the contour function. The contour function, you pass this function, the potential matrix, and the coordinates of the x, uh, and x, x, and y, y variables which, which contain the coordinates of x and the x and y coordinates of the field evaluation points. And then you will get, again, a correct scaling. And it will be very nice. You can produce very nice uh, pictures that so please include in your report that kind of picture because then easily I can I can very check very easily that the result is correct. So the work uh, to do first discretize the object for, uh, geometry. As I told you before, create functions that for different objects return the position of the center of the basis functions and the width or length of the basis functions. You can do this, for example, for circular objects. You will need uh, circular objects to compute the capacitance of the uh, of, of the reference capacitor, which consists on two circular cylinders. So you need the circular objects to compute this. But you can also compute a planar capacitor because the planar, the planar capacitor is much easier to, in the case of the planar capacitor, it is easier to write the function that discretizes the geometry. So you can start with a planar capacitor. And if everything goes right, uh, you can get the electric field. As you know, you know that the electric field must be like that in the planar capacitor. OK. And you will get uh, potential lines that uh, uh, you will get uh, potential lines that uh, go like this. OK. And close like this, etc. So you can. Uh, the, 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 the planar capacitor is so easy because it's easy to program. And also, you have the intuition of, of what must be the results, how the results look like. And it's very good for you to start. You know that for the planar capacitor, for the planar capacitor, the capacitance is approximately epsilon times the surface of the plates. But since we are in two dimensions in the the surface is one times the width of the plates over the separation between plates d okay so this is the the approximate uh, equation for for the capacitance so you can start with a planar capacitor and if the width is much larger than the distance so please set a small distance so that you can have an accurate result of this approximate formula. So you can check if you get the correct, approximately, uh, the correct uh, capacitance that gives approximately the same result as the approximate formula. OK? And then once you have this working, you can do the, uh, the the two uh, circular cylindri cylinders capacitor, because for this we have an exact formula for the capacitance. And then we can very uh, easily check when we have this program. The program is a bit more difficult, the geometry, the program to write the geometry. Once you have created the geometry, the program to compute the linear system, plot the results, etc., is exactly the same. So you only have to rewrite, you to write, sorry, a new function to compute the geometry and then compute the exact capacitance, sorry, compare with the exact capacitance. And here, you can, uh, once you have done this, you can uh, check if that for increasing number of basis functions, you get a smaller error. So after writing a function that computes the discretization of the geometry, you have to compute the elements of the linear system matrices and vectors. 
it is easy you, you have already done that in the assignment and also you have here all the equations to for the uh, elements of the matrices so it will be very easy to you to to do that in order to compute the independent term set uh, define for example the, the voltage difference the difference the voltage difference between the plates as one volt and then set uh, one plate to 0 0.5 volts and the other to minus 0 0.5 volts and then compute the shorter linear system so you compute the charge density at all the basis functions then you compute the total charge the capacitance and then you check with reference and here we, you can check what happens for increasing number of unknowns the error should decrease linearly remember the plot of the error versus the number of basis function or unknowns that you made at the assignment you can compute a similar plot here of error versus n and it should decrease like this in logarithmic and uh, logarithmic scale okay logarithmic scale it should decrease linearly like like this okay and then compute the uh, nice pictures nice figures for the potential and the electric field using all these functions that i explained in the previous slide and this is all you have to do for the two-dimensional case and i will explain the 3d in another video of course you can start with the 2d finish the 2d show me uh, the results and then if everything is okay you can do the the 3d of course you can you can write your report with all together at the end but in the middle you can just um, if you wish show me your your two-dimensional results so that i confirm that they are okay and then you proceed to the 3d so the next video will be about the 3d case